Go ahead, Ian. All right. Are we live? We are live and ready. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ian Rambrand. I am the chair of the Legal Issues Committee and an attorney at Klein HBC. Uh, we are here with three distinguished practitioners talking about recent developments at both the federal and state level. And as I understand it, Rich uh, Adriano was just able to get a recent update uh, moments ago. So we are going to hear from him and uh, talk about what it is that uh, he is seeing. Uh, we have three speakers, as I said. The first speaker is Rich Adri Adriano from uh, Ballard & Spar. He is the practice leader of the firm's mortgage banking group and also the incoming chair of this committee and the co-chair of the Legal Issues Committee in December. Our second speaker is Managing Director and General Counsel. Her name is Monica McCarthy. The firm or company that she works with is Crosscheck Compliance. And uh, Monica is going to talk about practical and operational tips for combating current illegal threats. Our third speaker is Elliot Johnson. He's part of the Consumer Finance and Business Litigation Team. He's based in Sacramento, but practices throughout the state. And Elliot is going to talk about Senate Bill 1079 and Assembly Bill 3088. And with that, I'd like the speakers to introduce themselves, but starting with Rich. Uh, good day, everyone. Thanks for having me again. Rich Andriano with Ballard Spar, and I'm based uh, in the Washington, D.C. office. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone, from here in sunny Southern California. Monica McCarthy with Crosscheck Compliance. Uh, honored to be here. Thank you, California MBA. And uh, honored to be speaking with my colleagues. Uh, hi there, everyone. My name is Elliot Johnson. I'm uh, based in Sacramento at Kleindent, D.C., but I'll soon be moving to uh, Los Angeles. So, uh, you know, you can reach out to me either places. So, thank you. Okay, and with that, Rich, we'll turn it over to you. Very good. Dustin, if you could move us to our first slide. And what we're going to look at, a number of issues uh, with the uh, with the Bureau. Uh, the first of which being there's still a nagging issue about the constitutionality of uh, the CFPB and really what affected the, Bureau, the Supreme Court determining that they were unconstitutional because of the uh, for cause removal structure of the director, which is now they struck that. So now the director serves at the will of the president. But there's the issue of what did that do to past bureau actions? And there's actually a case, another case involving the HFA uh, coming before the Supreme Court that may may address that. Now, quick refresh, member in seal of law, uh, the court, Supreme Court had two issues before it. Uh, was the bureau's co structure constitutional or not? And if it was unconstitutional, what was the appropriate remedy? Uh, it ranged from just striking the four cause removal provision to basically wiping out the bureau in its entirety. Uh, no one really thought that was going to happen. Uh, and the uh, Supreme Court did decide it was unconstitutional and took the uh, least uh, invasive uh, route of saying the director now serves at the will of the president, basically. Now, interestingly, the, the case, particularly as the seal of law, really is more related to what's going to happen to the CID that was issued against them. So it's back at the lower courts for that. Uh, Bureau took the position that acting director Mulvaney, who did serve at the will of the president because he was acting director, uh, ratified the CID and that made it fine. Uh, then Director Craninger, after seal of law, ratified the CID again, again, trying to say, well, it's now valid because they ratified it. And what the Supreme Court didn't address those. What about all the regulatory actions of the Bureau, all the mortgage rules and all the other regulatory actions? That wasn't before the court, so it didn't address it. But Craninger addressing a nagging question because people were saying, what happens to all those actions? In July ratified all or most all of the prior regulatory actions of the Bureau. Now, let's look at the next slide. We could see this other case uh, which is now coming before the Supreme Court. It's Collins v. Mnuchin, where the Fifth Circuit has held earlier this year that the structure is unconstitutional because of the director being only removable for cause. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? So the Fifth Circuit severed the four cause removal provision. Similar result. Supreme Court has agreed to hear Collins. The arguments are set for December 9th. 
But there's something very different here because the court accepted the petitions of both the Treasury Department and the shareholders of Fannie and Freddie, where the Treasury is really looking only at the constitutionality issue. The shareholders are also looking at if the FHFA is ruled unconstitutional, does that mean the court has to set aside past actions taken by the FHFA when it was unconstitutional. The thought is that could very well have implications for the Bureau and the actions it took when it was unconstitutional should the court get there. But for the court to get there, it first has to agree that the FHFA structure is unconstitutional. A lot of people think they said, well, they found the Bureau structure to be unconstitutional, so they'll find this structure to be unconstitutional. Not necessarily. During the SELA oral arguments, Justice Roberts uh, in you know, response to uh, someone arguing that you know Collins Venetian was similar, uh, basically made some comments indicating at least he didn't think the FHFA and the Bureau were an apples to apples comparison, suggesting uh, he might come out differently on the constitutionality issue. Uh, oral argument statements, it's sort of like reading tea leaves, so we'll have to see what happens, but uh, this is one to, uh, to look for and to see uh, where they come down on this and how it might affect past Bureau action. So stay tuned on that one. Let's move to the next slide. Now we'll get into some actions by uh, the Bureau. For years now, the Bureau has been looking at non-bank mortgage lenders to bring a redlining claim. And there's never been one in the past uh, against a non-bank. It's traditionally only been a bank allegation. Until now, uh, Townstone Financial, the Bureau filed suit over the summer. And uh, interestingly, uh, they refer to Townstone as a lender and a broker, and the company says that, no, it's only only a broker. Uh, but we'll see what happens there. Why, why did they choose this one? Well, we think we, we, think we know, because a lot of the allegations here by the Bureau are standard for a redlining case. But this one has something very different. What the Bureau did is it cited uh, a number of statements made by the print, it allegedly made by the principals of Townstone uh, during a radio show. They held a, you know, a Saturday radio show on a local uh, radio station, and they also did podcasts. And uh, some of these statements, uh, they're, they're quite interesting. They're not necessarily statements uh, you would recommend someone make in public or otherwise. Uh, and they are pointing to those as statements that would discourage uh, prospective African-American applicants from applying or from people living in the high majority or majority African-American neighborhoods from applying, and that would be whether they were African-American or not. And so what they're using here is they're pointing to the statements as evidence of in, an intent to discriminate, basically. It looks like that's what they're using. The redlining case is disparate treatment, so it is intentional discrimination as opposed to disparate impact, which is not. And here, we think they probably seized upon these statements as, ha, ah, here's our evidence of intent. This makes this case a lot different than any other case we've looked at in the past. Now, a threshold issue, the Bureau's bringing this claim under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Now, the Supreme Court ruled, we know, in inclusive communities a few years ago that you can bring a disparate impact claim under the Fair Housing Act. Uh, the Supreme Court has never addressed this issue under ACOA, and ACOA uh, has uh, interest, different language, excuse me, disparate impact, again, that's, uh, they haven't ruled, or the Supreme Court's never ruled whether you could bring a redlining case under ACOA. Uh, redlining claims under Fair Housing Act, language is much more conducive to bringing such a claim much less conducive under a co-op, very different language. So we'll have to see, you know, what happens because that's when you say to the government, ah, you can't bring in a co-op claim under, uh, you can't bring a red line of claim under a co-op, they don't listen to you. Court will listen. We'll have to see where they come out. Uh, will that issue eventually get to the Supreme Court? My guess is yes. Uh, whether it's in this case or another case, we'll have to see. But I think the issue will ultimately get to the Supreme Court. Real quickly, we'll look at the next slide, which uh, all this did on the next slide is note, these are standard claims that you see in almost any redlining suit. You know, you don't market out to the minority or protected class group, uh, either in general or particularly trying to reach out by you know, newspapers, media that, that cater to a particular segment that's underserved. That's something that, that the regulators, you know, Bureau, Department of Justice, banking regulators will look for. Uh, they didn't have any African-American loan officers among their 17 loan officers. One thing they also do is how do you compare to your peers? Now, 
there's always a disagreement between the company and the bureau or, or other regulator when they say here are the peer lenders and you look at the list and you go they're not my peers uh, but that's a debate I think that will always go on in these cases but what they do is they look at a group that they consider peers and they say how many applications do they get from the protected class that's at issue and how many loans are made and as you can see here they found very few applications from high majority uh, African-American neighborhoods and they high majority is 80% or more or majority which is being you know, 50% or, or more African-American and in the end uh, overall just a lot lower than uh, than the peer lenders. Uh, common sites so this is very common what we think made the difference was the statements we think that's what made the difference why they chose this one but uh, let's look at the next slide interestingly uh, latest supervisory highlights, and I recommend the supervisory highlights to you. Uh, what it is is the Bureau summarizes issues that examiners have found in examinations. So you could see what are they looking at in examinations, very important to know, and what errors have been made, because often it's something that could be quite common, and you might want to check your own institution and say, oops, are we doing the same thing? Let's check this out. So recommend you do read those. Here, though, it indicates um, there were bank and non-bank lenders. They don't. They, the details often are, are limited, so we don't know how many. Uh, it sounds like it was plural and bank and non-banks, and that they found violations of ACOA and Reg B with redlining in certain metropolitan statistical areas. And what they looked at is actions that they say would discourage people from applying uh, for credit. And they looked at their advertising practices. And this is something, uh, advertising mortgage loan, there are a lot of rules you have to look at. We'll get to some other ones soon, but here are some where they were really focusing on, they seem to have ads that exclusively included white models or loan officers that appeared to be white and the marketing was directed to majority white areas. They also did a peer analysis uh, and finding that uh, they got fewer applications than their peers. Now, key here, they handled this as a supervisory matter, not an enforcement. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, still puzzling why they ha handled it only as a supervisory matter, but note the Bureau is very much focused on redlining. One other point, just right at the end, uh, they also noted and cited some lenders for automatically excluding public assistance income without considering the actual circumstances. And you can't do that under Reg B. Uh, you have to assess all income and you must treat it equally. Now, you, you're allowed to determine will it continue or not, that's fair, but you can't just automatically disregard it. And that's what the lenders did in this situation and they were cited for that and had to take remedial action. Let's look at the next slide. Here, just real quick, eight consent orders so far against uh, direct mail VA refinance loan marketing. A uh, lot of concerns, as you know, there's been a lot of concerns with churning of VA refinance loans. So uh, based on that, there were some changes in the law regarding seasoning and such. But the MBA itself went to the VA and say, hey, there's some practices out there that concern us. And VA obviously got to the Bureau and we now have eight consent orders, but the investigation is ongoing. So there may be more and it's Reg Z, the MAP rule, you know, mortgage advertising acts and practices rule and the Consumer Financial Protection Act itself, which has UDAP in it. So those are all the claims. Uh, a lot of, you know, missing items when you, you know, trigger terms didn't have the required items when there's a trigger term under Reg Z. Uh, advertised credit that they really weren't gonna offer. Um, Simply, you know, they checked what they advertised and they checked their rate sheets didn't even have the terms they were advertising. Uh, big thing, false representation of affiliation with the government. They're being very harsh about that. I would really recommend looking at, in fact, some of the consent orders prohibit various terms, including saying that you're a VA loan specialist. That, yeah, that, that's pretty broad. So uh, I would read these consent orders just to see, or is there anything you're doing that might give you a bit of concern based on what is in these consent orders? Again, they're on the Bureau's website and there are eight of them so far and they started in late July. Let's look at the next slide. Just real quick here, ability to repay rule proposals. Uh, we now have a final rule. Uh, one of the things they were gonna do is propose to extend the GESC patch you know, loans that qualify for sale of Fannie and Freddie, uh, RQM loans. That is going to sunset 
or was going to sunset January 10, 2021. It will now be extended. And what they did is originally they were going to have it, uh, the way they were going to have it is it would expire uh, on the date that the uh, new QM that's being also proposed uh, came into a business uh, into effect. That would actually have created a gap period based on the rules work where a uh, certain loans, depending on when the app was taken, would qualify for neither the GSE patch or the new QM rule. Uh, industry pointed that out to the Bureau. And so what they decided to do and what a rule that was just finalized today, it's up on their website, not yet in the Federal Register, is have the patch survive for applications that are taken before the mandatory compliance date for the new QM rule. So that's, that's what we have. Uh, what the new QM would do, and this is just proposed, uh, we're waiting for the final rule there, is get rid of the uh, QM based on the strict 43% DTI and Appendix Q, which everyone hates, and replace it with a loan pricing construct where basically most for most first lien loans, if their uh, annual percentage rate was less than two points over the average primorpha rate, horrible acronym APOR, it would be a QM loan. Uh, existing product and point limits would apply. Problems, two problems. One, whether intentional or not, they the creditor has to consider DTI, but the proposal incorporates one of the general ability to repay provisions that doesn't have a standard. So basically, you'd be taking what's supposed to be a safe harbor where you know which side of the line you're on and you'd be applying a DTI standard with no standard. Uh, industry pointed that out. Also to compute the APR for comparison for an arm loan, you'd have to use the highest rate in the five years from the first payment. That would be a big problem. Most arm loans wouldn't be QM loans. Quickly, let's just look at the last proposal. Uh, on the next slide, there's season loan proposal. This is a concept that's been kicking around for a while is if a loan, is uh, been around for several years and the borrower has generally made timely payments, uh, should the loan be a QM loan, uh, regardless of whatever status was beforehand? That's what this proposal would do. Um, it would only apply to loans that for which apps are taken on or after the effective date of the rule, so it won't be retroactive. Uh, and basically, for really going to only apply to first uh, fixed rate loans, uh, term no more than 30 years. Basically, it has to satisfy all the point and fee and product limitations. There's a requirement that the creditor consider debt to income, but again, they incorporate this language from the general ability to repay standards that has no standard for debt to income. Industry's pointed that that's a problem. A uh, few here, and let's look on the last slide, just what it would have to do. Basically, they're looking at a three-year seasoning period. Uh, basically, uh, you can't hold it during this three-year seasoning period. The borrower could only make two payments of 30 days or more delinquency, no 60 days. Uh, they would allow exceptions uh, for we have pandemic now, so what if there's another type of forbearance? They would allow exceptions for that. And partial payments, 50 or less, uh, as long as there's no more than three, that's okay. Those are all proposals. Uh, we know they've extended the patch, so that's a good thing. We can don't have to worry about January 10 and that thing expiring. We'll have to wait and see, and we'll report on the other final rules uh, when they become finalized. So uh, that's that's all. I turn it back to you, Ian. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of info. I appreciate the updates. Uh, Monica, over to you. Great. Um, thanks so much again for the opportunity. And I'm going to let um, Dustin move my slides along. So um, we're going to talk about some threats. Um, and let me start first with just uh, there's our legal disclaimer as to my remarks. Next slide, we'll start with our current climate. So obviously, um, the outcome of the presidential election is going to have an impact on what regulatory changes may follow. Uh, two very different um, paths. Uh, in addition, right now, the pandemic has disproportionately impacted certain protected classes, and you're seeing people react to that, as well as to the reactions around civil unrest that are heightening some issues. Then lenders are facing their own challenges with the continued uncertainty, and as a result, many have tightened uh, lending standards. There's tremendous pressure due to increased origination and servicing activity. 
Um, and that results in the legal and compliance teams um, that are busy addressing emerging risks amid this once in a generation crisis. And I, and I love that term. It actually comes from a, a great article, um, Jonice Gray Tucker from the Buckley Firm authored. And um, I'm gonna to refer to a few articles uh, during my remarks and each of those are identified on my last slide. And I highly recommend um, each of them to you because they do, do go into a lot of detail um, that is um, very helpful. So next up, let's talk about the current legal threats for lenders. So we're seven months into the pandemic and you know our clients and a lot of my colleagues and talking with them, the three key threats that um, we're seeing now for mortgage lending is fair servicing issues, fair lending issues, and then I'll just briefly touch on, um, you know, keeping an eye on the authority for the new Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. All right, so let's start with fair servicing issues. Um, first off, servicers are already um, continuing with their compliance for existing regulations. Uh, the fair lending laws, obviously, you know, protect against both disparate treatment and also disparate impact the intentional and unintentional sides of that. Then you've got the FTC with their UDAP rule and the CFPB having added abusive to be UDAP. And the state laws um, each have their authority to enforce as well. And uh, California's new DFPI uh, clarified their authority to enforce UDAP as well and broaden their authority. So then you also have servicers now um, dealing with the new regulations under the CARES Act on uh, specifically some of the issues with credit reporting and forbearances. And then also the CFPB's guidance uh, and some, some changes. Um, specifically, you know, in some of the remarks, the CFPB warns servicers about the risks of causing consumer harm. So very big focus as we've seen over these seven months and a continuing focus over consumers and how to assist them and not harm them. Um, next, of course, is the fact that unemployment has triggered an increase in defaults. Um, while the new regulations limit servicers uh, collection efforts, uh, reporting, and uh, uh, the extension of forbearances. And then on top of that, servicers are dealing with remote employee issues and the technology of getting everyone the equipment they need to work remotely or getting them to be able to work back in the office and the related privacy issues of keeping the consumer data confidential and continuing to have access to it. So lots of issues um, that servicers are battling with and, and have been. So what are some recommendations? So for maintaining fair servicing, some of the recommendations that we would make is, um, and a lot of servicers are already employing this, so that would be to develop a roadmap to follow, starting with identifying your known risks. Um, every servicing shop knows what those are. I've listed some of them, payment processing, handling of late fees, collection activity, and especially now law submit. Um, the next step, evaluate your current environment. Uh, you know, obviously you've got an increased volume, you have increased complaints from the increased volume. You've got folks working remotely. How is that working? The avail availability of skilled staff. I mean, people are hiring and trying to find folks and get them trained uh, is definitely an action the folks are taking. Then there's pu the public focus on what you're doing, regulatory changes and guidance that you've got to process, and how are you doing that? So uh, the next step would be to evaluate your current capabilities. Um, adjusting to this change, um, accessing um, the customer data and how you're doing that securely. And another important point is testing and monitoring and the need to really do that under COVID. Um, there's another article by one of my colleagues um, that I've identified as well that really goes into the monitoring and testing under COVID and makes some good recommendations there. So I commend that article to you. Um, and you know, really staying on top of what you see on the fairness of the equal service levels. Uh, and then last step, of course, is implementing the needed change in controls and mitigation steps. 
So again, getting staffing, having the right staff, training them, even though you're super busy, the importance of fitting in that training, continuing to do the monitoring and reporting, and then tracking any changes that you're making. And the most critical, of course, is documenting all of these steps so that you can you know, both show the regulators what you're doing, uh, track all of the things that you've got going on in this fast-paced environment, and to assist with any issues and claims down the road. All right, so next up, some uh, threats to be aware of. And um, Rich had already mentioned uh, being sure you review the CFPB's advisory highlights. So these are ones that came out in the summer. And um, another great article that really goes into these in, in great detail was the Mortgage Banker September 30th um, article. And so you can see here some of the key areas that the CFPB has identified that they continue to see when they are um, examining servicers. And, and again, it's some of the same things we see when we do our audits and we also come in and we help folks with their MRAs. This is what we continue to see, the challenges with providing um, consumers um, you know, certain statements and disclosures and uh, refunds of forced place insurance and um, escrow statements and um, servicing transfers. Again, um, regex, we continue to see the challenges with onboarding transfers and how they continue to trigger issues. Um, and you know, lastly here I note to the CARES Act, because here there's a lot of credit reporting compliance and there've been a lot of webinars lately on how to comply with it, what you need to do. And um, so that clearly is an area where servicers have had to adapt and will continue to do so. And one issue I would point out is that while the regulators have said that they may be lenient um, if there are delays in responding to credit reporting disputes um, due to the pandemic, I remind you that consumers still have um, you know, their own right of action. So um, you know, document your reason for the delay and uh, be, um, be aware of that um, as well. So next up, some best practice tips for fair servicing. Next slide, best practice tips. Okay, there we go. So um, again, these are not new for most of you. Review your policies and procedures to ensure that they are updated and changes don't dis, um, trigger disparate treatment uh, impact. So for example, um, you know, now that you're um, letting folks waive late fees or offering certain loss mitigation, who has the authority to do that? Is that the, um, the reps? And if so, are they offering those things consistently according to your policy or is there some disparate treatment as a result? So these are the things that you want to be looking at and looking for. Um, you also want to ensure that your processes for re reconciling accounting records of third parties are thorough and timely. Um, uh, there's also another article in my list um, by one of my colleagues, Jim Shankle, and he talks about um, how to avoid surprises in mortgage servicing. It's a 10 page article, lots of great um, recommendations and um, best practice tips, again, of things that we are seeing that are continuing to be challenges for the servicers and that the regulators continue to uh, really uh, touch on during their exams. Uh, next up, of course, review your complaint reporting, perform your root cause analysis, and analyze, especially now, any loss mit uh, complaints. You want to track new regulations and guidance, which you're doing, and document, document, document your actions and your activities. That will serve you well. Um, and lastly, you know, evaluate your monitoring and testing for fair servicing. You want to get help from experts as well to understand your data. Um, some of you have some great fair lending experts in-house. Um, leverage that. For those that don't, you've got um, you know, outside resources, folks like Crosscheck, your outside counsel to, to lean on. So that's it for fair servicing. Let's move on to some fair lending issues. So currently the focus um, a lot of lenders are looking at is the underserved communities and populations. Um, and you know, that's been re re heightened obviously over recent months. And, you know, Rich talked about the Townstone case, and I'm 
Not gonna be commenting on that because Crosscheck is actually retained by council for Townstone. Um, but I definitely would say that that may have impacted a lot of the focus of lenders on um, what they're doing with underserved communities as well. Um, and so uh, next up, lenders are looking at their fair lender data, their HMDA data to understand where they are uh, and where they're not lending and asking how they can improve. And so, for example, uh, one area that may be of concern is where there's been a tightening of credit standards. Um, you know, are there overlays that you're implementing and uh, putting in place? And do those have a disparate impact on minority populations? Or might they be viewed as proxies for disparate treatment? So again, you, you're putting certain things into place. You want to be sure you're looking at what your outcomes are. Um, and so you want to look at the uh, reporting on those things. And another area that we're seeing is the increased use of artificial intelligence, AI, uh, both on the uh, marketing side as well as on the credit side. And so what we would definitely commend um, to everyone doing that is while most of you are doing the model validation that goes along with the use of AI, we also really commend you to also be looking at the outcomes from using this. And again, is there an unintended disparate treatment or impact uh, that results uh, from these AI tools? So again, analyze your results and um, lean on your um, uh, experts to assist you with that. Next up, a few best practice tips for fair lending. So obviously ensure the accuracy of your Humda data. Most of you do that, um, you know, whether it's monthly, quarterly, and ensure that you've got the right training going on. Uh, perform your annual risk assessments of your fair lending programs. Evaluate and reevaluate your monitoring and your testing. Are you really looking for those issues that are critical today and in the places where you may have changed some of your business practices? Um, also, you want to review and enhance reporting to the board and management, both so that they um, are tuned into the trends of what's going on, as they should in this environment especially, but also you want to document their requisite oversight as part of your CMS. Um, and lastly, you know, really be sure that the board and executive management um, is understanding your data. You know, don't rely on generic reports that you know you're getting printed out that are not very instructive or perhaps um, aren't really highlighting or giving you the information you need. Sometimes you want to go and get the mapping done so that you can really take a look at where you're lending geographically, where you're not, as opposed to pages of numbers. You know, a map helping you understand that. So again, um, you know, leverage the expertise, get help with those things as you're making uh, changes and wanting to um, improve and stay ahead of these issues. So that's it on the fair lending side. I wanna move now just quickly to the California's new Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. So what does this mean for mortgage lenders? Um, well, in talking with a number of my client and my colleagues um, in industry, we had a good call last week with um, uh, Mike Flynn at Buckhalter and Melissa Richards and, and you know, folks from Fannie and many others. And I think we collectively sort of agreed that the big impetus for this new um, you know, department and in the Department of Innovation was so that they could um, add authority so that the Bureau, our new Bureau, can um, regulate debt collectors, credit reporting agencies, and especially fintech companies. Um, but they still are going to continue their regulatory focus on mortgage lenders. So that is still an area of concern. Um, they've also enhanced um, broad UDAP enforcement. Uh, they've clarified that. And, you know, some say it may influence a more aggressive approach. So that's yet to be seen. Um, lenders can also expect uh, to continue to see coordinated exams with other state and federal regulators. And so if one state finds one issue, it's gonna to spread to others and the CFPB will likely get involved. Um, some say it may lead to increased litigation. So those are all things that you should be aware of. 
Um, but I would also say, don't forget about, um, you know, the DBO's hot button issues about per diem interest. And also, Rich also mentioned, you know, the eight consent orders that are out about marketing and advertising. So just keep those things in mind because they're also definitely um, of interest um, to, the, um, to the new organization. And then last slide, just um, here are the articles that I mentioned. Um, highly commend those to you. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me or give me a call. So thanks very much. Hi, thank you, Monica. And just out of interest, what does CrossCheck do specifically, and where can they find out information about what it is you do? Thanks, Ian. So you can find out by reaching out to me, because what CrossCheck does is we're a compliance consulting firm. So we help banks, mortgage, fintechs, and credit unions with their compliance with all the regulatory requirements. And right now we're doing a lot in the fair lending space. And we're seeing a lot of that. We also do a lot of um, internal audits, and we're doing a lot of that in the servicing space. So we're very familiar with that, uh, both the servicers and their subservicers. So really, um, in the mortgage lending space, we work with a lot of mortgage lenders nationwide, helping them with whatever their issues are. So feel free to give me a call. And we also partner with lawyers on engagements where clients want to have those be attorney-client privileged. Right. Thank you, Monica. All right, uh, next up is Elliot Johnson. Elliot's gonna talk about the legal impact of current COVID-19 legislation. And there's been uh, a whole bunch of uh, uh, changing topics along the way. And he's gonna talk about uh, the two that uh, immediately impact us today. That's right, uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, uh, so today we're gonna be talking about a couple of bills that we have coming down. Uh, one is gonna be Senate Bill number 1079. That's coming from the Senate and we have Assembly Bill 3088. These bills are uh, looking to address concerns that the legislature has Oh, Ellie, I think we lost your audio. Yeah, I still can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, we got you back. Oh. Did you, did you guys hear anything? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I heard, we heard you introduce the two bills, and then I think at that point you got cut off. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, all right, so uh, so moving on, uh, uh, Senate Bill number 1079. Looks like my slides aren't working either. Sorry about the technical difficulties here. Uh, always has to be something. I'm just glad it all happened now. <laughs> uh, there you go. Dustin, could you uh, could you move this? Uh, yeah, I think you're there. moving it. All right, so. Uh, Senate Bill number 1079, it's going to be effective January 1st, 2021. It amends the Civil Code Section 2924 series, and the legislature's intent on this one is to uh, prevent the impact from foreclosures that might be related to COVID-19 hardships. Uh, so it's going to create additional requirements to finalize a foreclosure uh, trustee sale. And uh, to understand how this new requirement is gonna work, uh, I think you guys need to understand a couple of uh, definitions. So first is prospective owner occupants. Uh, these are people that uh, want plan to live in a property after purchasing it at a foreclosure sale. Uh, they have to move in within 60 days of the trustee's deed being recorded and they have to plan to live there for at least a year. Uh, they can't be related to the borrower and they also cannot be acting as an agent for the borrower. Uh, the next definition is the eligible tenant buyer. Uh, that's a natural person who is occupying the property as a tenant. They need to have a, uh, a arm's length lease agreement, and they also cannot be related to the borrower. And then the final definition you need to know is the eligible bidder. This is the last two uh, definitions, and also including an eligible nonprofit organization that might be looking to purchase a property. Okay, so how's this section going to operate to uh, you know, keep foreclosure sales open. So essentially it has a waterfall design that provides if one of any of the following events happens, then the trustee sale can finally be deemed as final. 
Uh, basically, you can just call the section that no sales are final uh, section of SB 1079. Uh, so the, the first event that could end the sale would be a prospective owner occupant. So someone who's looking to purchase the property to live inside uh, is the highest bidder of the trustee sale and they submit an affidavit as to their status as a prospective owner occupant. Uh, if that happens, then the sale is final and concluded. So the second event that could happen is 15 days passing. If 15 days pass, the sale is concluded unless an eligible tenant buyer or an eligible bidder uh, submit a bid or a written intent to place a bid to the trustee. Uh, if they submit an intent to place a bid, then there, it extends the timeline to 45 days. If within 45 days, an eligible tenant buyer uh, submits a bid to the trustee that's equal to the last and highest bid, they will take the property. If within the 45 days, an eligible bidder uh, places a bid that's higher than the last and highest bid, then they will take the property. The practical implications of this is that the legislature is trying to make another opportunity for people to repurchase a property because they want people actually in homes and they don't want vacant properties. Uh, unfortunately, we anticipate there may be some fraud with this with borrowers uh, attempting to have people play, uh, place a face notice of intent to place a bid and then forestalling eviction, displacement, and the finalization of the foreclosure. So this is also going to require, require some additional notices to tenants uh, basically, the notice of trustee sale is going to have to include additional information that will advise tenants of their rights under 2924M. So, with the, now the trustee under 2924F, the notice of trustee sale is going to have to include information uh, that within 48 hours after the trustee sale, uh, a tenant can call the trustee's phone number or visit their website and find out where the sale was held and the last and highest bid. It's also going to have to include uh, the fact that they can place a bid within 15 days after the trustee sale or uh, place a notice of intent to place a bid. And then finally, it'll have to provide that all bids must be in no later than 45 days after the trustee sale. So that also means that a trustee is going to have to maintain a website or a phone number. Uh, the phone number needs to be free and available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It has to provide information regarding the trustee sale and it has to be accessible uh, with an identifiable number listed on the notice trustee sale. So SB 1079 is also going to increase the penalties that will uh, be put on lenders or anyone that owns a uh, residential property that's left vacant after foreclosure. So the legislature has uh, increased its penalties uh, regarding blight and unmanaged properties. Uh, in the legislative history, they're specifically talking about uh, pools that are left stagnant and allowing mosquitoes to spawn, overgrown grass, uh, just general blight that's going to drive the property values down in neighborhoods. Uh, you can refer to the slide if you'd like to see the, the specific definition for failure to maintain pro property, but essentially the legislature is looking to incentivize lenders to maintain properties uh, following a foreclosure and an eviction. So, uh, the, the standing law requires that within 14 days that the property owner take action to, uh, to resolve an issue with the property after being cited, and they can also uh, receive an additional 10 days if they require clarification for what needs to actually be resolved. The previous fines were $1,000 per day uh, that the property was left in violation, and now they're going to be increasing to $2,000 a day for the first 30 days and $5,000 a day uh, each day after that. So this is really creating a strong incentive for lenders to maintain properties and to also make sure that they're finding notices that are going to be posted on the property regarding any sort of citation or code violation. Uh, so SB 1079 is also going to uh, require property owners to comply with just cause and eviction requirements uh, for any tenants that are, are holding over in the property after foreclosure. Section 2924N provides that nothing in the article will relieve a, a lender from uh, a requirement such as just cause eviction. And this falls in line with the legislature's intent to uh, prevent evictions and vacant properties uh, when it's due to COVID-19. This also means that SB 1079 falls in harmony with our next topic, uh, which is AB 3088. So this one is known as the Tenant, Homeowner, and Small Landlord Relief and Stabilization Act of 2020. 
Uh, not surprisingly, they have not come up with a good acronym for that one yet. Uh, but it's going to be effective August 31st, 2020. Uh, and it places a, some small requirements on servicers and lenders in addressing forbearance requests. And it also establishes a moratorium on evictions uh, when COVID hardship is causing the, the financial distress. So the additional uh, uh, requirements for reviewing a uh, uh, forbearance request. So essentially, if a borrower creates a or sends in an application for a forbearance request, uh, the lender will now be required to provide a written uh, notice for any denial if two conditions are met. One, the borrower has to have been current on payments as of February 1st, 2020, and the borrower has to be experiencing financial hardship indirectly or directly due to COVID-19. The bill is silent on what grounds the forbearance request can be denied for, uh, but it does provide what a lender must do in the case of an incomplete application. So if there's an incomplete request for forbearance, uh, the lender or servicer needs to identify the curable defect in the written notice. They have to pro provide 21 days for the borrower to cure the defect, and they have to accept the revised forbearance request in that period. Uh, after they receive the revised response, they have to provide a, their own response within five days after that. So existing law also requires lenders to uh, record a declaration uh, of attempting to uh, contact a borrower to discuss loss mitigation options uh, to uh, try to avoid a foreclosure. Section 3273 is going to add additional requirements to the declaration that's required, and it will now require that servicers uh, attest to whether the written notice was for why the forbearance was not provided. Well, they have to include the written notice, and they uh, will also have to include a statement as to whether uh, forbearance was subsequently provided after the notice uh, period. So section uh, 3273 also includes a safe harbor provision. Uh, you can refer to the slide if you want to see more detail, but essentially a mortgage servicer, a beneficiary, or a, or a uh, mortgagee will be considered to be in compliance with the section as long as they provide forbearance in uh, accordance with the requirements of the CARES Act. Uh, the section 3273 also anticipates uh, uh, loss mitigation uh, following a denial of forbearance. It provides that the legislature's intent is that if a uh, borrower is denied a forbearance request that they be offered a loss mitigation option. Uh, the statute does not actually provide an obligation for lenders to provide post forbearance loss mitigation. Uh, it's essentially just a call to action from the from the legislature. Uh, section 3273 also includes a waiver section. The borrower cannot waive their rights under this section and any waiver will be uh, construed as void and against public policy. Uh, there could be some practical issues uh, in some situations given this waiver. Uh, for instance, if a borrower is signing a settlement agreement uh, before a foreclosure for a, a deed in lieu, it could construe the entire settlement agreement as a waiver of their rights to be reviewed for a forbearance request and strike out the entire settlement agreement. So there are remedies under Section 3273 as well. Uh, for a material violation, a borrower can move for injunctive relief, they can seek damages, they can recover restitution, and they can also recover reasonable attorney's fees. The reasonable attorney's fees are a one-way street uh, that can't be recovered by lenders, and the, the uh, remedies here uh, essentially mirror the remedies that would be available under the Homeowner Bill of Rights. Um, the borrower can recover uh, attorney's fees if they prevail on uh, injunctive relief or uh, or the action itself. Uh, but it's safe to say that this this act that this uh, section does provide some teeth for borrowers, and uh, it does not provide a remedy for borrowers. Borrowers' remedies will have to come from the operative loan documents. So uh, we. we we have some time constraints, so I'm just going to uh, kind of skim through these next parts, uh, but the, the AB3088 is also going to regulate unlawful detainers. Uh, a notice to pay or quit has to include additional notices. Uh, it, it now has to be 15 days, and it has to provide a COVID-19 declaration 
uh, which essentially says that if it's signed and returned, the borrower cannot be evicted based on that notice for default, and, and the, the declaration requires the borrower to, to say that they're suffering harm uh, due to COVID-19. There's also going to be specific language that needs to be included in the notice to pay or quit. Uh, Section 1179 includes that there's two pay periods uh, in, the code, in the relevant COVID period. Uh, you can check up the slide if you want, but essentially, uh, if you're requesting uh, a, a notice of default based on payments throughout both periods, you'll have to serve two notices to pay or quit. Uh, the, the legislature is also limiting what reasons an unlawful detainer can be based on. Uh, there can't, can no, you cannot bring an unlawful detainer based on non-payment of rent unless the uh, tenant was guilty of unlawful detainer before March 1st, unless they uh, failed to return the signed declaration, or if they were in a material term, uh, or they were in breach of a material term of the lease, uh, committed nuisance, waste, criminal activity, or they refused to allow the legal owner to enter the property. Uh, this, this bill also has implications for evictions after February 1st. Uh, if the tenant submits a signed declaration and they pay 25% of the amount of rent due, they cannot be evicted based on non-payment of rent for the COVID period. Uh, there's also our, our final point here is a defense to eviction. Uh, AB 3088 makes it illegal to evict anyone for any cause of action if the true intent is uh, the non-payment of rent due to COVID-19 hardships. Uh, this has heavy-handed penalties, such as if they prevail, you cannot evict them for 180 days. And it may prove a point for defense for occupants to say that regardless of whatever the actual cause of action is, the true intent is to get them out because they're not paying their rent due to COVID. Uh, so this could be problematic for, for any sort of unlawful detainers. Uh, and, and that covers uh, my portion of the presentation. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Elliot. I appreciate it. Uh, as you can see, those two pieces of legislation have a significant impact on a lot of other uh, pieces that relate to the foreclosure and recovery of the property. So, uh, you know, learn them, uh, be very familiar with them, make sure your trustees are familiar with them, make sure your uh, down the line unlawful detainer attorneys are also familiar with them because there is a bit of risk there. Best mitigated by contracts, uh, insurance, and those types of issues, but um, there will be litigation around these types of claims relating to forbearances and evictions in the future, much like uh, the uh, waterfall that we saw uh, at the time of the Home Owners Bill of Rights. So with that, we'll now take any questions. Dustin, do you have any questions? Yeah, so I was going to mention, uh, so you can use the uh, um, questions panel right now to uh, submit questions that uh, for any of our speakers to answer. And while you're uh, while the audience is doing that, I've got a couple of quick reminders. One, the uh, um, uh, webinar today is being recorded and will be available likely this afternoon or tomorrow uh, on our YouTube channel as well as the committee uh, page on our website. So you can make sure and uh, check that out if you came in late or if you've got a colleague that missed it, make sure and send them that link. It's a free webinar. Um, additionally, we are in the middle of our annual uh, membership drive. So it is membership month at, Cal at the California MBA. You can join right now. If you haven't joined and you're interested in membership, this is a great time to join. You can get 15% off your first year's dues to join. And then the final note that I will make uh, is that uh, our legal issues and regulatory compliance conference is coming up here December 7th and 8th. Uh, Ian mentioned it earlier in the, uh, the opening, but uh, you can go to our website right now and click the link to uh, register right now or sign up as a sponsor. We've got some great uh, sponsor opportunities that are still available, but they're actually going pretty fast. So if you're interested in sponsorship, this is the time to do it. And you can also register as well. So with that, Ian, I actually don't see any questions right now, and I know we're getting tight on time, so I will turn it back over to you. And if you've got any questions, actually, you know, I'll uh, switch over to our contact slide. So if you have any questions for our speakers and you're just too shy to mention it right now, you can uh, shoot an email or uh, give a call to one of our speakers, and I'm sure they'd be more than happy to help you out. But uh, with that, Ian, I'll turn it over to you to close this out. All right. Thanks very much to all of our speakers, Rich, Monica, Elliot. We appreciate it. Dustin, we certainly appreciate your efforts in putting this together. Thank you to the membership for being here. 
Uh, if you have any questions, and uh, our contact information is listed there. We can also make available our PowerPoint presentation for you so that uh, it can be discussion points for you, your clients, or uh, issues that uh, you need to circle back to any of us about. Thanks very much, and have a great week.